Okay, guys, are you ready for the last lecture of the course? Um, we're going to end up with um, talking about teacher evaluations. So we're going to end this class um, with talking about the ways in which we can assess and evaluate teachers. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, so teacher evaluation in Florida, we use the um, we have been using what we call the value added model. So what do we mean by that? Um, which is a combination of test scores and then um, other measures. So in Florida, half of the um, teacher evaluation um, or has been in the past has been the, the value added model and the other half has been um, up to the district, which is typically something called the CAST in, um, in Duval County, which is a, um, teacher observations. So the value added model, and you can see here, um, we have, this is last year's score, the blue, and then the green is the predicted performance, and the red is the actual performance. The value added model is this little piece here. So this predicted performance takes all of these things into consideration. So the number of relevant courses, achievement, prior achievements, students with disability status, English language learner status, gifted status, um, um, average attendance of the school in the class, the number of transitions within the class, the homogeneity of the class, the class size, um, and then if the student was held back. So it takes into all of these accounts, kind of like that everything in the chicken sink uh, metaphor we talked about with regression. And then it's this little bitty piece that we're, that is, that is what we're considering as the teacher's contribution, the value added by the teacher. And the problem with the value added model is that it's highly, highly variable. So what we find is that the difference from year to year for one teacher is greater than between teachers in the same year. So we're seeing more variation within one teacher than between teachers. So it's not working because theoretically, if a good teacher should have consistently high scores, right? And a poor teacher should have consistently low scores. And that's really not what we're seeing with this value added model. So in so in theory, it sounds like it would be a really good thing, but statistically, when we're actually looking at the scores, it's not working out well. And so what we've seen in really recent years is that Florida's been backing off of this model. So um, obviously, you're not going to discuss this in groups, but I want you to think about um, the pros and cons of this system, you know, and the critical analysis of the, of the system. So you can, you know, pause the video and think about this for a minute. Um, so we want to think about how can standardized tests inform us about teacher quality. Um, and I don't want you to say, well, we should never use standardized testing because it does give us some information. If I said, would you want your own child or your niece or your nephew or someone you care about to be in a classroom with a teacher who none of her teachers ever pass the test, none of her students ever pass the test? You'd probably say no, because the standardized tests are probably giving us some sort of information about the quality of the teacher. The question for us is, is what information? And there's a couple of different ways we could look at this information, right? So one would be just the number of students who pass the class or who pass the test, right? So teachers who have more students pass would be presumably better teachers, right? Um, and what would be the problem with that? Who would be disvalued um, or who would be at a disadvantage because of this type of system? Right, teachers who teach special education students or lower level classes would be disadvantaged, right? So if I teach more English language learners, if I teach more students with disabilities, I'm more likely to have students who don't pass the test. That's no indication of how good a teacher I am, right? It's like if we had doctors and we measured how good a doctor you are by how many of your patients die, right? Um, do oncologists, doctors who, who treat cancer would look like much worse than like dermatologists, right? Because it's much more likely that if you're under the care of an oncologist, you're going to pass away than if you're under the care of a dermatologist, right? Does that mean that oncologists are worse doctors than dermatologists? No. Doesn't mean that special education teachers are worse teachers than gifted teachers, right? Just because few of their teachers, students pass, right? It's just the developmental level of the students, right? So another way we could kind of take account of that would be growth, right? So we could measure how much do your students grow from one year to a next. And the problem with this is, right, that um, that that gifted teachers, teachers of advanced students, have much less room to show growth. So if all of your kids got a five last year, then um, the chance they're all going to get fives this year is less, right? That the chances that some of them won't probably won't get a five, right? So you're going to look worse. Um, so it disadvantages gifted teachers or teachers of advanced AP, IB type classes. So um, there's not a really great way to kind of systemize the standardized testing for teacher quality. 
can. And then we can talk about the validity of even using these standardized tests to measure teacher effectiveness. So what are the tests designed to measure? Right, they're designed to measure teach um, student achievement, right? Um, but we're using them to measure teacher quality. So the real big question is, is this a valid use of test scores? So does student achievement tell us how good of a teacher you are? And that's maybe a philosophical question, but we're certainly using tests in a way that they weren't designed to be used. And that is a question of validity. So if we're not going to use test scores, what other sources of information can we use? Um, certainly, we can talk a lot about um, teacher observations, and that's something that we do, and you'll talk a lot about that maybe in your field courses and in your internship. You'll look at CAST and the ways in which we, we observe teacher quality. Um, some problems with that might be subjectivity, right? So depending on who's, a, who's um, assessing you, right, and their opinion of you, right? So if you have an administrator who, um, who you don't get along with, who you have a personal issue with, they might grade you lower on your evaluations, and that's something that a union would, um, would fight against, right? So again, I'll put a little plug in there for joining your teacher's union to make sure that you're protected against some of those employment issues and grievances. Um, however, it, it's somewhat subjective if we're looking at observations of your performance, right? Um, on the other hand, um, we might have a, t um, a principal who just gives everyone really high marks because they like them, right? Um, but that might protect teachers who maybe aren't as effective at improving students' um, learning, right? Um, on the other hand, um, we, there has been some movement to maybe have an outside person come in, so someone who doesn't know the teachers, who doesn't know the kids, come in and give more of an objective measure of what students, of, of that performance of that teacher, right? Are there downsides to having an outside person come into a classroom? Yeah, if you think about it, they don't know the students, right? They don't know the context. So there's going to be a lot about the dynamics in the classroom that they might understand. It might not be a fair assessment of what's happening in the classroom. Um, and then the other one that kind of comes up when I talk about this in class are parent and student evaluations, right? So, um, and we can think about developmentally um, what might be appropriate, right? So um, if I ask kindergartners to evaluate their teachers, every single kindergartner is going to say, wow, well, I have the best teacher in the world, right? Um, but that doesn't mean the kindergarten teacher is actually very good, right? Kindergartners just happen to love teachers, right? And I could get the opposite, you know, in a high school, right? I might get a lot of, you know, crabby teenagers saying, oh, my teacher's the worst, even though they might be actually pretty good, right? So we might, we might take that with a grain of salt. But certainly, student evaluations are how faculty um, are evaluated at the university level. So we have some really good case studies of what this looks like, right? And um, actually, what we know is that student evaluations of professors are actually pretty biased. So we know that, um, that female professors are systematically receive lower evaluations than male professors, um, even um, yeah. Um, and then they've done this in a variety of ways. So we, we can look across across the university, across universities, across the United States and see that, that male professors get higher evaluations than female professors. So I mean, we could say, well, maybe male professors are just, you know, better at their jobs than female professors, right? Um, but we've done experiments where we've done like an online class. So their students are getting the exact same instruction um, from you know, but half of them think it's from a male and half of them think it's from a female. And in that case, the male professor still gets a higher evaluation than the female professor, even though they're getting the exact same thing. So we know that there's bias in the way that people perceive male and female instructors. So, I mean, hmm, take that into account when you're doing my ISQ, right? And we also know that there's also bias by race and ethnicity, that, um, that people of minority races and particularly student um, professors with non-English backgrounds tend to have um, lower evaluations than white professors and privilege. And so using evaluations as a sole means of evaluation of instructors, which is common practice in a lot of universities, um, really leaves it open to um, a lot of bias, right? And we can think that that might even be more true in a K-12 environment. Um, that being said, I just want to say a little bit about how ISQs are used at the university, um, because I don't know that all of you um, are really familiar with this, right? So every single year, every professor's ISQs are given to the department chair and the dean, and now even the college, the university president is really being a lot more concerned about these ISQ results. So they are important to our evaluations, and they're part of my annual review, and I have to turn them all in, right?
Um, even the comments that you guys write, they go and people read them. So it's important, right, that you're writing down things that you would want my, you know, boss to read. Um, so it's important, it's important that you complete them, right? So they look at those results. So if you haven't done your ISQs at this semester, please do. It's important. Um, you know, and if you want to give me all fives, that'd be great. No, just kidding. I do. I want your honest feedback. And I think that honest feedback is important. But know that it is that it is calculated and is looked at. So, um, yeah, be honest and, um, and for not, so I'm tenured now. So I, I went through, I've been here long enough that, um, I was approved. I, I got promoted. I'm here for non-tenured professors. Those ISQs make a difference about whether or not they have a job. So after you've been at the university for five years, you turn in, um, your teaching research and service and, um, the faculty at your department, at your college, and at the university as a whole make a decision about whether or not you get to stay. So that's pretty scary. Um, but even for tenured professors, I have tenure. They've made the decision I'm going to stay. But if I have unsuccessful annual evaluations, I can still lose my job. So even if you have a if you have a professor who's tenured, not me, but someone else, right? Who um he might be having difficulty with. It's worth it to contact the department chair to try to work to um, if you have issues, if you have things that you don't that aren't meeting your satisfaction, know that you do have power as a student and that we at UNF really do care about the quality of the education. And we want you to have a satisfactory experience. So please um, use the resources that are available to you to make sure that you are getting your needs met as a student. OK, that's enough about ISUs. But I do want you to kind of know um, what, how student evaluations might be used in evaluative sense for teachers. So should tests be used? And I think that's kind of maybe the question of the day and something you should really be considering and thinking about in your philosophy. And as we move forward with policies across the United States for education, how should and should tests be used to evaluate teachers? And then should pay be tied to test scores? Um, you know, and I think it really, to me, it kind of goes back to this idea of like, um, I I think teachers should be rewarded for the work that they do. And so the, the argument in favor of pay being tied to test scores is that pay right now is tied to longevity, right? So the longer I, I'm a teacher, the more I get paid. And certainly just because I've been able to manage to be in the classroom for 20 years doesn't mean that I'm actually working harder or doing a better job. So maybe there should be some sort of reward for the work that I put in as being a teacher. I think the question is, is test, are test scores a good representation of that? Um, or is a merit-based pay in general a good idea? And I mean, I think there's a lot of opinions about that. I mean, certainly, I don't think that I've ever heard a teacher say, well, now that I'm going to get a bonus, now I'm really going to work hard to make sure my kids learn stuff. I mean, that's really not the case, right? We all go into teaching because we care about kids, not because we want a paycheck. I mean, we want to get paid and we want to be rewarded and compensated for the things that we do. But that's not the motivation, right? So maybe we're thinking about this in the wrong kind of way. What we do know is that when we have high stakes attached to test scores, whether that's keeping my job or whether it's um, a bonus, what we see is greater incidence of cheating among teachers on test scores, but not necessarily improvement on test scores themselves or improvement in instructional practice. So the question of the day is really, what is a fair way to, to evaluate teachers? Um, and I wish that I had like a magic answer for that. I wish I could say, well, here's a fair way to evaluate teachers. But if I did, I'd probably, you know, be doing something else right now. I'm just kidding. But I, I, I don't have an answer, honestly, about a fair way to evaluate teachers. I think this is the struggle and the issue that we're all grappling with in our current state of education and something that I want to, I want to leave you with as we move into a new era of, of teaching and, and as you as the next generation of teachers to be thinking about what is a fair way to evaluate the practice and the art that you are engaged in. So I want to end this lecture by saying that I've so appreciated having all of you in class this semester. It's been a joy to teach each of you, and I'm so looking forward to seeing the great and wonderful things that all of you accomplish in your teaching careers. Best of luck to all of you, and I am my door is always open to all of my students, so please stop by, say hello, keep in touch. Um, and I wish you the best. Bye.